Welcome to the Best Music Podcast, where we see behind the curtain and discover the hidden habits and success secrets of noteworthy music makers. I'm your host, Dan Spencer, and this week's featured guests are Tom, Gavin, and Darren of the band Godsticks. You're the word of the time. Now, it's been a long and eventful road for Godstick since emerging onto the scene in 2009, and since then, the band's sound has become progressively heavier and received further critical acclaim, culminating in the genre-redefining prog metal masterpiece that was Emergence, which ultimately led them to being signed to K-Scope. Now, having extensively toured Europe since 2012, in the last few years, the band have finally gained recognition as the explosive high-energy live act they've always threatened to become. Drummer Tom Price and guitarist Gavin Bushell bring an accomplished and aggressive playing style to back up Darren Charles's unique vocal sound and Dan Nelson's driving bass. Godstick's sixth studio album, This Is What A Winner Looks Like, is out now. And the links are in the video description if you're watching the video and in the show notes if you are on audio. Tom, Gavin, Darren, thank you so much for taking the time to come hang out with me today. Dan, we need to hire you to introduce us <laughs> in the, for every gig we ever play. And even for every person we meet from this point on, we'll say that. Sounded amazing. That was amazing. I, I cried to be to recognize the band even. <laughs> it was that effective and complimentary. Well, I went to a fortune teller the other week, and they told me in my past life I was actually a town crier. So... <laughs> So I, th- I think I think I think we're all lining up. It's all coming full circle, and uh, yeah, <laughs> we're good to go. So, guys, the new album was amazing. I feel so lucky. I got to get a little sneak peek of it. Obviously, it's available now. What the question? My first question is: What does dissonance and the concept of dissonance mean to you guys, musically and also artistically? Yeah, dissonance to me is, is, is creating that tension that you're desperate for it to resolve. And I think the longer you can maintain the dissonance before resolving, the braver a musician slash artist you are. Um, it's, an, it's, it's never pleasant in, for me in, in isolation. Dissonance is just horrible. Um, so it always, I suppose it's like the pleasure and pain sort of thing. You have to experience a little bit of pain to appreciate the pleasure. And that's what dissonance uh, that's what dissonance represents to me, and this, and it, like I said, it, the braver artists use it for longer periods. Hmm. Braver artists. Could you define? Like, I would say, like people, like, like bands like Radiohead, for instance. There's tons of tension in their music, um, and they always seem like the genius of Radiohead, for instance, is, is that they always seem to provide the release at the most appropriate time. Mm. And so like, you're de- it's, it's to the point where it sometimes becomes excruciating almost. And they think, oh, do you know why I can't listen? Ah, oh, right. This is fantastic. <laughs> and they resolve it just like they're geniuses for resolving that dissonance at exactly the perfect moment. And I think that's what a lot of artists mm. try to do. I'm not, don't get me wrong, I don't think that we do it as well as Radiohead. Um, but it's, it also requires, for, from a listener's point of view, it also requires a bit of patience because a lot of pop music, which I actually really love pop music, there's not a great deal of dissonance in there. Um, and it's always, <laughs> that's probably why I like it a lot at times because it's always enjoyable throughout. Whereas dissonance, you sort of got to earn the reward a little bit. Challenge the listener. Yeah. yeah. Tom, do you think you could speak to the uh, the idea of dissonance in terms of a rhythmic perspective, both both from like a timber of the different sounds of drums, but then also thinking f- perhaps from a syncopated perspective? So we could think about non-syncopation 
as being dissonance versus syncopation as being resolution. Uh, and then I think we could also step one step further, uh, like Darren was just saying, and we could even think on a more meta level as time signatures you're used to hearing as being resolution versus time signatures you're not used to hearing as being dissonance and requiring that level uh, of a listener of contending with something that is outside of the norm. Yeah, honestly, this is a this is quite a quite a difficult question for me to answer. I think I, I think uh, in my kind of in my own personal way of processing and, uh, and understanding music, it's probably quite different to these guys. And I think I am a bit more probably like uneducated when it comes to that, I suppose. But yeah, when you were talking about the uh, the rhythmic aspect and the sense of time signatures and how and yeah how how, how the dissonance uh, you know how how you want to kind of resolve it, I guess. That kind of like leads to what a lot of hopefully a lot of uh, a lot of progressive uh, well in that label progressive rock uh, and progressive metal bands want to do is to play yeah play the complex music play the play the odd time signatures and things that you would expect but also try to not make it like look like that's what you're like you're signposting that this is what we're doing <laughs> this is what we're about kind of thing like that you still want the the structure uh, of, of the time signatures, the structure of the songs, and the rhythms on the drums, uh, from my point of view as well, yeah, they've all got to kind of serve the music, and they've all got to try to take those signatures and those and those rhythms and just yeah, try to make them accessible. And I think that's what a lot of the uh, well, a lot of my personal favorite like uh, progressive artists do. I hope that we <coughs> kind of do the same as well. We def I think we definitely have that approach where we just try to uh, yeah, may maybe not. Uh, completely simplify everything but but just yeah try to find a good a good through line that's you know that's not too you know not not too distract distracting you know or could have somebody thinking oh i think that bit is in seven or i think that bit is in nine <laughs> anything like that it's just about trying to yeah just trying to create hopefully some good music and a good with a good through line no matter what kind of rhythmic uh, syn syncopation and combination might happen i guess thanks for that Gavin, do you have any thoughts you'd like to add around dissonance? Well, just to echo what Darren said, really, music is full of questions and answers and mm. chaos. So adding dissonance for those chaotic moments and then resolution, I think that's pretty much all it comes down to, really. Metal music is full of chaos and dissonance really helps with that. So, But it's important to have that resolution so that the audience can feel comfortable in it as well. It's a great question, by the way, Dan, yeah. to be honest. We don't usually get asked, well, quite frankly, nerdy things. We're quite, we're yeah. nerds at the end of the day, <laughs> and it's a nerdy question. Yeah. So like, yeah. we, it, it is interesting to explore the, you know, the, the dissonance aspect of music, because mm. um, there's like a lot of artists I used to like, there's like Frank Zappa, early Frank, some, some Frank Zappa stuff is just pure dissonance. Yeah. And I just, I don't like it to, I like a lot of it, but I, I need... I really need something to resolve personally, but they're like there's there's like sort of films and there's and there's and there's compositions, as I said, just uh, just dissonance throughout. And I don't really understand how people can enjoy. Like it's the same as horror films. I don't understand how anyone uh, enjoys horror films, but they do. Uh, and but <clears throat> that's something I suppose it relates to the dissonance in music. In that I can I like it for a certain amount of time. But if it doesn't resolve, then I just don't understand mm. it. But that's not to say, you know, but that's, I think it's personal to everyone uh, how much dissonance they can bear before, without resolving. Joni Mitchell is really clever. It's putting like questionable chords throughout with the sus chords and it doesn't resolve for quite a while, to mm. be fair. So, yeah, she's another one that's really clever at doing that kind of thing. Yeah. yeah. So you can see how long you can stay on the five chord. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> probably right. People insane yeah. by having like a, a sharp, you know, oh, a, yeah, yeah. a yeah. dominant sharp nine chord yeah. just drumming on that. Let's see how long you can just torture people. I would imagine it was a torture yeah. method. Yeah. At some point. Yeah. Well, I, I I look very much forward to the next album where we will hear the uh, the altered song on which we will just we will ju we'll just be hanging out on the five for the entire song yeah. using only altered chords, and I can't wait to experience what that's going to be. Coming to torture chambers near you. <laughs> <laughs> well, okay, but let's take this one step further because you know, listening to the album, it seems to me that. You, you guys make this uh, some conscious artistic choices around a certain 
consistent level of uh, and this is not dissonance in a bad way, but dissonance in a good way. You know, it fits the genre. It fits the sound. It's this beautiful thing where also lyrically, too, it's like you're contending with sometimes darker ideas, uh, real gritty stuff about human existence. What happens when we zoom out and we look at sort of a song level at the album? Was there any thought around tension release dissonance consonance within the ordering of the song in the track list oh that's it well tom i sort of yeah it is important it's not as important as it once was like the order the order of songs on an album just the way people consume music and i suppose it's to be honest i would say it's probably older people like ourselves who are concerned with an album (laughs) because ultimately it's just pointless it's a way you're wasting your time Mm. Um, because people do, there's still not quite a lot of people who consume music on vinyl or on CD, but generally, mm. even myself, I, I very rarely play an album through sequentially anymore. It's just playlists these days I listen to. Mm. Um, but John, Tom takes uh, a, a time, I think, more than myself. We all, we all uh, decide, there has to be sort of, it's, it's difficult to describe because I, I always imagine things, even when I'm writing a song, I always imagine like little, I'm always picturing waves and stuff like that, where it's like, I, whether that represents anything, whether that's tension or something like that. I just want some a little dip to come down there and then to go back up and I want to maintain that sort of thing. It's really difficult to describe. But like when it comes to album ordering and things like that, there has to be some respite. If there's, if there's a lot of songs that are just bashing you over the head, which hopefully they are, there has to be some respect because it's just don't enjoy stuff like this. Yeah. It's like a lot of ma- I, I admire it. They're like as I said, it, it it doesn't matter so much these days. But like if you listen to like some Mastodon song uh, al- albums, I don't know which ones, but like there's some that just go bang bang every song bang 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 bang. And after four song, I just can't bother to listen to this anymore now because there's no let up. But like that's not to say like the rest of the albums. It's just that. I, I just don't want to consume it all in one sitting. And if I do consume an album in one sitting, then I want a little bit uh, of something different, a little bit of light and shade. But I still got no problem with a band that just goes bang. Like Meshuggah, for instance, there's the opposite. Like Meshuggah, it's an onslaught from start to finish. Yet I can sort of like I can consume uh, like a Meshuggah album, for instance, just because. Uh, I don't, I don't it meets know. your expectations. That's yeah. what you're expecting from that kind of thing. If you expect Mastodon, maybe you're expecting a bit more light and shade. My, my sugar's a lot more challenging, really, yeah, really yeah, I suppose. Yeah. It's a lot more challenging to listen. Well, I remember when I first listened to my sugar and Catch 33, I thought it was the worst pile of crap that I've ever heard in my entire <laughs> life. And I remember, but I accidentally, because I had no other CDs in the car, I was just on all the time then. And then eventually I thought, hold on. These are geniuses. These are <laughs> geniuses. What's going on? I don't know these are. Do you know what I mean? So, yeah, yeah Tom probably got a, a more insight into album, album ordering than myself. Oh, well, well it's, I think it's just because I think I'm a little bit different to those guys in that I am, I guess, still quite old school in the way that I consume music and that I will listen to a vinyl record, listen to side A, listen to side B, listen to a CD as well. You know, that's kind of like my preferred way to, to consume music. So yeah, when the you know when the whole kind of the uh, planning and the, and the ordering of the album was coming, you know, it was definitely something that I was I was you know, really trying to think about and really consider. And yeah, you, you know, you've hit it on the head about having uh, light and shade and just having uh, yeah, just having peaks and troughs and and uh, and changes throughout the uh, throughout the uh, the track listing, just so the yeah the music isn't uh, isn't uh, just uh, overbearing and it isn't trying to. Yeah, it isn't trying to do one thing or the other. It's not trying to be too 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 quiet all the time, and it's not trying to uh, be shoved down uh, shoved down your throat all the time, kind of thing. It's uh, it, yeah, it's it's trying to trying to find the balance, but it, it all depends, I think, on on what the material uh, you have to work with, I suppose, you know, and uh, and uh, because uh, because yeah, I think you want to get like you know the best songs that you can uh towards towards the front of the of the album, I suppose, you know, but that doesn't necessarily mean that they all have to be really heavy. And really, you know, really, really driving and really powerful. They can be lighter. You know, it's all about what kind of, you know, what, what, which ones kind of speak to you a little bit more. You know, and I think that, I think that with this album, I think we got we've got a good mix of it because we have some, you know, some real strong ones and real heavy ones uh, at the beginning, and then mix them up with some lighter stuff. 
And I think we've got that on, uh, kind of mix on both sides as well. So there's a little bit of, uh, uh, yeah, ni uh, hopefully, uh, hopefully, at least to my mind anyway, a nice little bit of balance. But it is 100% something that that uh, that I and we consider when we... When All we I could hear then together. was like, what's wrong with the songs at the end of the album? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, uh, that's got another, like, if I don't think the best songs, it's, I think the most accessible ones mm. are at the start. That's how I... Mm. It, it's, it's, I, I learned something new, Dan. You know, I didn't know that you did sing well, the worst songs at the back. No, well, no, I, I, I would say the more accessible <laughs> ones are at the, at the front to draw I, people in. I didn't say that uh, that uh, the ones on the set on the second like side B well, are bad songs. I wasn't saying that. I wasn't saying that. I'm just saying, you know, you, you know, you got you got to make a choice, haven't you? You got to make a choice because when you know when people look at. Uh, the album on Spotify, and if they're streaming it, for instance, they're going to see those first couple of songs. You know, maybe they're not going to, you know, do the swipe up and uh, and have a look at the bottom half. You know, maybe those ones are not going to be played so much. You know, so you've got to think about making sure that okay, I need to have, you know, well, yeah, as you said, the most accessible songs, the songs that are going to mm. attract people's attention, but also kind of show what what the the record's going to be about. You know, where you don't want to have all the heavy stuff at the front and then all the quiet stuff at the back, you've still got to mix it. And yeah, well, especially when you think of album sides as well, of uh, vinyl sides, you know, it's about uh, making sure that you feel a balance between both sides. That's what, that's the way I think about it anyway. Never, in, never, never the say crack, things are You formed a few cracks there in this band, Dan, you honestly, we're, we're, we're about two conversations from musical differences. <laughs> I, I know. Yeah, you know, I I, I want to let you know that I've actually been hired as a mole to come in <laughs> and sow the seeds of emotional disruption. You've done a damn good job, to be honest. Yeah. Okay, well, wow. see? Yes, if you don't mind me saying. <laughs> I'm worth the money, as, as I say. <laughs> well, I think what would be really interesting um, is for each one of you to share what you feel and what you internally define for yourself as success in music because as a band together you've been forging quite a path it takes a lot of work takes a lot of years just from just just thinking about the rehearsal just picking the name for a band like the amount of work that can go into that and uh, the teamwork and everything uh, I, I would love to understand based on everything you guys have done internally for each one of you how you define success in music so perhaps we could go uh, left to right, starting with uh, starting with Gavin. Uh, I don't know. It's, it all depends on what you want to get out of music, I suppose. If you if you're looking for um, fame and fortune, and that's going to be a tall order for any musician, really, it, it comes few and far between. If you and for you, get if you just want to um, for you, Gav. Oh yeah, for you, Gav. What is it? What is it for you? <laughs> success um just being able to write and get some appreciation or if somebody likes it then that's that's success as far as i'm concerned yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what would you talk about? but you're next in the lane oh i am suppose yeah but mine's a really long answer <laughs> okay all right I'm my right. do is uh, like well no it isn't mine's more of a downer Oh, I think okay. All right. Okay. Shall I, I want to end on a so low we'll note. Get bleaker as yeah. we go along. This is the <laughs> okay. I want to end on the dissonance, <laughs> like a brave musician would. These are the sus chords. All right. Okay. Yeah. All right. I better. I better, I better make this a peak before we do the trough. <laughs> uh, and well, yeah. I think. I think. Uh, I think my own kind of goals in music come. Uh, I don't uh, necessarily see see myself or see myself desiring to be you know to be big and famous. I kind of. I like giving myself kind of smaller, smaller goals, if that makes sense. But that, that kind of goal will then kind of sort of get a little bit bigger each time I reach one, if that makes sense. Because back when I was, I, I first started you know, w working as a drummer, I wanted to, oh, deciding that I wanted to do this for a living. The first goal was simply, can I get paid to, to be a drummer, <laughs> basically, you know, and to play and to play play a gig and make a living from it. So yeah, the, that goal would would gradually uh, will will increase, you know. But in terms of original music and kind of working with God sticks, yeah, it's a it, yeah, it's about uh, reaching different milestones, I guess, you know. Yeah, one of you know one of those massive milestones was was being signed to a label, you know, and we're really lucky that, that we're with Kscope. And then the next one was okay, we want uh, we want to play a headline show and we want to sell, you know, we want we want to get a decent turnout and we want to play this venue, kind of thing like that. And then the next one would be. I want to be on this festival, and I want to be, you know, playing, uh, you know, playing in this place to and uh, and playing in front of 
this amount of people kind of thing like that. It's just trying to kind of like almost set myself a new target every single time so I can always kind of keep on pushing myself and, uh, you know, I work hard to try to think, well, if I keep doing what I'm doing, if I stick at it, hopefully this will be the next goal that I reach and hopefully that will keep on increasing. I hope that kind of makes sense. Perfect. I'll have, I'll have his answer. <laughs> no, that was a good answer, yeah. Tom. <laughs> I haven't really got a donor answer. It's just I, I suppose... Oh, you promised. <laughs> I think that for every album and for every year that goes by, you have to start... I've seen myself revise expectation and revise what, what I consider successful. If I would, you know, going back, let's say, 10 years ago, would I consider what we've achieved so far as a success? Probably, well, you know what, probably, I don't know. I'm not so sure because perhaps because it is, I do take for granted some of the things that we have achieved. Like, you know, again, signed to a label is a big deal these days, especially because it's almost impossible. Selling albums and having those albums distributed by a record company all over the world is a big deal. Being on some of the, you know, being, uh, having toured around Europe a few times uh, and experiencing all these different countries and these different fans is a big deal. But I'm just entirely dissatisfied. It's really, it, I suppose I shouldn't confuse success with satisfaction because I'm very rarely satisfied um, because I'm always want to achieve more and more. But not because, um, not because I don't consider what we uh, uh, produce as music. It's, I think it's, I do consider artistically that we've been successful. I'm really satisfied with the music we produce, and nothing. And I don't think we'd ever compromise. You know, if there was a formula, for instance, a musical formula that says, you know, you play this, this type of music and this structure and you'll guarantee this many fans on these many album sales, that wouldn't interest, I don't think, any of us, mm. to be honest. With you. It's just all about the art. But it'd be lying to say, but on the same token, to say that although I don't care um, about those things in the sense that we wouldn't change any of our music or the style of music in order to please other people, I st why still that other people like our music. Otherwise, if it was just about creating, although we do create music for ourselves, if it was just about creating music for ourselves, it would be a lot easier just to sit here and just record it ourselves and listen to it ourselves. We must want some sort of external validation. Um, <laughs> well, it is. And, 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 and you're always under pressure as well is to portray yourself always as successful. So it's really difficult to even talk about success because you is to say that you don't feel that you're a successful band is sort of like negative marketing in a sense, and that's and so you're always hesitant to like do a post about saying you know buy your ticket you know buy tickets for a gig in advance rather than pay on the door and like don't forget to purchase our new album. Um, but like sometimes that's exactly why you want to need tech because people the more the more you portray yourself as successful the more people think you're successful and don't require your support in a sense in order to continue. But I suppose huh. I don't I don't consider ourselves I don't consider myself or our band successful. But I also don't know what <laughs> I would consider <laughs> successful to be. Well, you know, like I said, I revise my expectations. So like what I would consider success to be at the moment is to put on a tour and all the shows are sold out, for instance. Or we had some moderate chart success in, our, in, 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 the, in the rock slash metal charts. And I'm worrying me moderate, is it like top 100 or something <laughs> like that? Just something that we could just hold the art on and just say, oh, that, that's what we achieved. Mm. I'd like to see progress, that is, is, I suppose. If we keep progressing each time we release an album, um, I would consider it successful. But... It's more. It's just more and more difficult. It's, it sounds like a oh, you know negative. I'm not being negative because I don't hold anyone responsible. Oh, you weren't buying our albums. It's the all fun. No, it's just there's a lot of the problem is it's a saturated market. There's so many bands out there vying for your attention, but unfortunately they're all really good bands as well. It's not even if it's all. <laughs> you know, there's loads of bands out now yeah. are really really good. So like you're stuck in that you're stuck in competition with a lot of people, and it's really difficult unless you do something highly controversial to stand out from the crowd. And I don't think that we're capable yeah. or, or want to be infamous. <laughs> mm. 
Well, you bring up a really interesting point, and I think this is one of the amazing parts about a band, and I think I think we'll talk about that next, is the diversity of personality and the diverse, just, just between the three of you, how success was defined differently. You know, we say it takes all types to make a world. Well, I think it also takes all types to make a band, right? Because it, you, someone needs to be deeply unsatisfied with whatever has just happened and wanting to forge forward, right? So that everyone else is going to keep moving as fast, right? But then that person will also be pulled back. The brakes will be put on that person by someone else in the band who's like, you know what? We just made some art. This art was great. This was good. Let's just hang out and enjoy it for a second. And that beautiful balance that happens there. So now that we're talking about being in a band and balancing out personalities, I'd love to know from each of you again, what you feel the sort of number one or a couple of things that you think makes an ultimate collaborator or an ultimate bandmate? (laughs) Well, I think you hit the nail on the head, the different characters in this band, like you, uh, as Darren, he's not always negative, but he does have that realistic point of view on things. And that can tend to like put you in a situation where you think, "What's the point?" <laughs> <laughs> it is. It can be. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's fine. fine. But then Tom will come along and literally just say, "Well, actually, we've achieved this. <laughs> <laughs> we've actually done some good here, and there's there's prospects for this." And um, that tends to drive the band forward. So I think that is the perfect collaboration. <laughs> <laughs> It's a pint. <laughs> yeah, Gavin, I, I agree with Gavin. It's really important. It is. We have got different personalities, and um, but the one thing we all got in common, and that's this is important because I used to when I first started this band, these two weren't in it, um, I, and I did everything myself. I, like I, it, not because the two other people in the band at the time couldn't be bothered. It's just I assumed I had to do everything because I started the band. I was in charge, and like after like you know six years of doing it. It really drains you being the only person, you know, uh, who has to mo- constantly motivate other people and constantly look for the positives and drag people with you and do everything. So when I found these two, um, who, sh- who, help- who share the workload, and that's a big deal, like sharing the workload, like, and Gavin's ridiculously positive, so that cancels me out a little bit, who's ridiculously negative. And then you've got Tom... Uh, He's, he's ridiculously positive in a sense. <laughs> you need two ridiculously positive like persons. To cancel people, like, this negative. To cancel this out. But, you know, I am. Like, I wouldn't say that I'm optimistic. I'd say that I have, I'm just del- slightly... Del- I think it's important. We talk about this. Of, in all musicians, to a large degree, every single one without exception, has to be delusional in some in some way. Otherwise, you just wouldn't do it. Because if you look at the reality of the situation, this is a waste of time. Do you know what I mean? After like at a certain point, this is you think if this was a business, you'd be thinking, what? What, what have I just spent my money on? Where's my money just gone? Yeah, yeah. All my free time is being taken up as well. Mm-hmm. So you have to be delusional in the sense that oh, at some point, if you keep pushing ahead, something will give. You know, something you'll get more and more. You know, people buying your arms and more and more fans. But yeah, for me personally. Is it really important to have positive people around um, who share the work, who've got a really good work ethic? That's that's vital. It's really difficult to drag someone along. Who's too, you can't you can't have two negative people in the band, like because Dan, who was in our band, who was who was the bass player. Wait. I just, I passed the audition? Guys! <laughs> Guys! <laughs> I don't even play, I don't even play bass. What, what, what? <laughs> well, you only passed the audition because you've ended up splitting up the band and we're going <laughs> to <laughs> It's been my plan all along. <laughs> so, like, Dan, it was, it was the bass player and it was like, uh, 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 he left uh, after this album. We all, it was like pre planned and whatnot because he was going off that he wanted to do, he's into all those different types of music and he wanted to, it was like really amical and we were all still friends. So, it, but it was pre-planned as well before the album. But he was the other negative person in the band and he was always like, you can't have two negative people. It's just, I need to be the negative one. Otherwise it just brings everybody else down. You know, I'm not depressing or anything. I just, uh, I don't think. Anyway, you no. just said, I, I said, what's the, 
I make you think what's the point. No, I, you don't make me think what's the point. <laughs> what do I make? No, you it, you have a realistic idea on everything. But in this business, you can't be too realistic. Oh, yeah. Otherwise, you will question, what's the point? <laughs> you need that our delusional aspect. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. What about you, Tom? Yeah. Uh, from my point of view, when it comes to uh, a collaborator, I think uh, what I found very, very helpful with this band is that yeah, I've got, I've got, I've got bandmates. Well, especially uh, Darren here sitting next to me, who isn't afraid to tell you that you could be better. And yeah, yeah, he's, uh, he's, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's kind of like you know, it's, it's his own way of encouragement. You know, usually I guess most, most people would kind of be like. Oh yeah, you know, yeah, that that was great. Yeah, do this bit and try try like this. You know, you can do this. You know, maybe practice that a little bit, and then that will get better. You know, but Darren's not afraid to to kind of tell you that. Well, you just played there. That was not good enough. You need to yeah. do this better. You know, yeah. and that is honestly a very refreshing and a very good thing. And I know yeah. that. Well, I definitely felt felt the the frustration. And Darren will say straight away. I think I'm quite a a, a very stubborn person when it comes to. Yeah. But, uh, kind of, <laughs> to, really? Yeah. To when, yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. I guess just to when it comes to you know, you, sometimes you get stuck in your ways as a mu- as a musician. You know, the, you know the way, yeah, the way you, the way you like to do things, the way you perform. But straight away, he's he's straight away, he's, uh, you know, very very clear to say, you need to be more like this because this is going to help you in the long run, and this is going to help the music that we're creating as well. You know, whether that's you know just trying to, you know, pay pay very close attention to things that. You maybe maybe have overlooked or haven't like put a lot of like a thought into, or whether it's just to say you just need to practice more, <laughs> just just keep yeah, on yeah. going, you know. And uh, yeah, I definitely feel that uh, uh, from Darren here, and you, yeah, it's also like a, it's also like a, a natural version of it as well. Because when I you know I like watch Gavin play guitar, and I look at him playing guitar, and I think he's really good. Damn, I need to make sure that I'm really good to play with him, <laughs> you know. So yeah, yeah, it's a it's a it's a nice kind of like it's it's subconscious encouragement. But there's also very much in your face get to work encouragement as well, mm-hmm. and I yeah. think and I, yeah, and I think having some of that involved also helps and makes a good collaborator. Yeah, because everybody thinks they're the best, don't they? At some point in their yeah. life, they always think, yeah. "Oh, I'm great," and then uh, they need somebody to say, "Well, actually, yeah, you're good, but you could be better." And just listen to this. So I, I try and hold us all to the same standard. It's not yeah. my standard; it's a standard that I've just arbitrarily picked, and I don't meet that standard. And I am afraid, I, I always say, if, hey, if, if anything, and I'm just constantly having to go at myself anyway and constantly scrutinizing my own playing mm. and performance and everything. And if I don't think it's good enough, then I'm going to have a go at myself as well. Mm. You know, and I encourage you, if there's anything you want to say, I don't take any offense. No one takes yeah. any offense yeah. because mm. I honestly think that these two are capable. I think that anybody, to be honest, is capable of anything if they work hard enough of it. I think everybody is. Sometimes it takes people longer than others. Um, but that's, I think everybody's got potential to be as, as, as great as they want to be at everything. And, and, and I see that in these two. And sometimes it just, it just, if you work hard at something, it's possible to achieve, uh, not everything, you know, but certainly in the field that you've chosen, if you work hard enough, you, you should be able to achieve the vast majority of things you want to. You've described such a beautiful dynamic of honesty, but then also everyone being on the same page that the honesty, it's its not about saying you person are bad at playing or you person need to fix X. It's about saying we're on a shared mission. We have a shared goal and to keep each other because we all – as far as I'm concerned, from a biological perspective, we all default to laziness. It's the yeah. easiest bio. It's the easiest biological route. Like the yeah. e- we, we are programmed for minimum effort. Yeah. And I think being aware of that and having people around you, and then being open and receptive, someone say, "Hey, look, I know what you're capable of. That's not it. Let's go. That's that. That's such a beautiful dynamic. So." I think what would be really interesting for us to talk about next, because it comes directly out of this conversation about what it means to be a good collaborator, the honesty, the willingness to work on stuff, is what you guys think about practice. You you are all, I mean, relatively speaking, far along in your music journey that it's, you know, you're not there sort of like, how do I hold my instrument? It's high level stuff. Right, you're learning your own songs. You're memorizing your own songs. You're learning set lists. You may have songs from several albums memorized, which I don't think people understand how much work 
it takes to maintain that level of memorization on things. Yeah. Like it, it's it's not at all obvious because the standard is bands get up on stage and play for like two hours straight, and it's like that's a lot of work to remember two hours of music. Yeah. So uh, I'd really love to hear again from each one of you because I'm really loving this dynamic where we go one at a time and you guys talk with each other too your personal thoughts about how you practice uh, and then specifically how you balance sort of technique maintenance with repertoire maintenance or if you're at a place where they kind of are one and the same. Well, I'll start. You start this time. Time is the biggest enemy uh, of any sort of progress and that's as the older you get. The less time you've got to do anything. So if, if I've had any advice to any younger musicians, it's just practice when you're young because yeah. you're going to find it a lot harder when you get older, mm. especially to not just maintaining your technique but progressing. Practice is, is – memorization, the problem it, – it, it's really it's, – it's a really difficult and depressing um, journey when it comes to having to rehearse the material because we – it is a lot of practice. The amount of time I still got to sit, you know, even like songs that we've played, like Emergence, for instance, the song that we play, I got to sit down even the day and just sat there with a metronome I, to trying to curb the profanities that are <laughs> desperate to be unleashed from my mouth. But I'll try and I'll, I'll maintain my composure. Um, it's, it's annoying. It really annoys me the fact that like this doesn't do... Why, you know, why I've done this loads of times before. Why, why have I got to keep? Why, why do you need reminding? Why do you need reminding exactly? You know exactly what to do. Why, why do I need to look at the music and the tab? You've played this countless times, you idiots. <laughs> that's basically um, uh, <laughs> <laughs> that's your answer. That's my. You know, it's, it's yeah. irritating. I yeah. really find it frustrating. But then I just oh, I've got to be done. You know, I, I'm big, and I'm always trying to uh, just. If anything, I just want more time. I like when it, when it comes to you know finishing an album and then going out and playing it live. The the last two months and maybe yeah, the last two months have just been learning the new material, going over the old, old material, and the next four weeks up until the live shows will be rehearsing, practicing, rehearsing, practicing, and learning and you know playing and singing. That's a new that's a new new nightmare for for anybody who's, who's recently introduced themselves to that, it's like there's not even any um, meth, meth, methodology to uh, singing and playing at the same time. Basically, you keep playing something over and over again. You keep singing it over and over again. You try and do it together over and over again. And eventually, it's not even like, it's not even like you will master, it won't even be in during that session, for instance, that it'll come together. It'll be some arbitrary time in the future when you least expect it you realize oh i can do it now yeah do you know what i mean it's it's absolute pain because your brain needs to process because i wish that if they did everything they were told yeah. or they learned or that they were supposed should be capable of after all this time you shouldn't have any problems with anything they shouldn't have any problem these pain hands hands <laughs> not people <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> <laughs> you shouldn't have any issues with anything. You shouldn't. You should be able to. How many, how much hours? Do you know how many hours I've put in over the years? It's like a large percentage of my life, and still, yeah. and like the other, the other, uh, the biggest, my biggest issue. They probably haven't got the same problem as me. Is tension. It's like the other one is like if it doesn't matter to me if I play something. If it, whether it's a technically difficult piece or whether it's a song or whatever. It doesn't matter to me if I've played that correctly 100 times in a row. Not only do I have to play it in order to be satisfied, not only do I have to play it 100 times perfectly in a row, but it has to feel comfortable. Mm. Otherwise, it doesn't feel comfortable. Or I didn't think that was, that was straightforward. Then as far as in my head, I, can't, I think I can't play it properly yet. Mm. And trying to maintain every single, like, every single thing uh, you do well on an instrument is done without tension, is done relaxed and without tension. But achieving that sort of equilibrium of like muscle memory and repetition, repetition. It just but it's hard to just relax. It's hard to 
And like you imagine, all well, that's like there's so many musicians with physical problems and RSI and things mm -hmm. like that is because they're just trying their best to relax, but mm -hmm. they're just so desperate and determined to achieve what they want to achieve on the instrument that they have to just torture themselves. So like mine isn't a pleasant experience, but I've got a really weird relationship, as you can imagine, with with guitar especially, you know, especially when I was younger. My parents even take the guitar off me like when I was young because they'd see it was like torturing me because if I if I just I had to play it perfectly, if it wasn't perfect, I'd just go mental, you know. It's just be so. I've both I've chilled over the years, but deep down I'm still a little bit insane when it comes <laughs> to um, playing the instrument. But it's worth it for like that small amount of joy when when it comes together, and it's only ever fleeting. But it's sort of, bizarrely enough, that tiny percentage of your life, yeah. and it could be about 0.1% of my entire play in life, bliss. that I, there's bliss. <laughs> but every time, but it's a fraction of it, is it all worth it? It's, oh, that's, it's fantastic. <laughs> but like, that's, yeah, they probably got different experiences. Well, I was, I was just going to say, if we were playing, and I'm not saying playing pop music, isn't difficult or anything like that but three minutes like pop sort of format easy chord progressions then it wouldn't take as much work but what we're playing is essentially compositions so it's quite tricky there's lots of time changes lots of complex um, note lines and whatnot so it takes a lot of practice and as Darren said as many times as we played it before you still got to go over and over and over it because like anything you need to get yourself up to scratch any sports person, they've run a marathon um, plenty of times, but they still need to train for the next one. So it's it's, it's just like that with anything. Really. I hadn't thought of it like that. It's a good one. It's like a marathon, this setting. <laughs> <laughs> Although I think I'd find, I I I think uh, just playing in time. Is, is, I, I, I'd find playing pop songs equally as different. I'd probably find yeah, this it's... easier. I think this type of music's, easier mm. than playing like strumming uh, and playing like, ah, whether yeah. it's like Americana mm. or whether it's country, whatever, those are different styles. Because there's a certain amount of feel that's required that to just, that I think that's harder to achieve. This is easier. Mm. And the reason it's easier, because nobody in prog music ever shuts up. It's always <laughs> all the time while on the drums, right? Was an indication. So you haven't got time you, like, to get that sort of motion <laughs> feel. It's not required a lot of the times. And that's, I got tons of admiration for those bands. In fact, I always look up to like bands that are just strumming some, like, you know, th I don't know, like, uh, like what's Johnny Marr and, and guitarists? The like, uh, yeah, the Smiths. I don't like yeah. the Smiths, but I'd imagine, I really admire those rhythm, I really yeah. admire rhythm guitarists. Mind you, those those songs would be quite tricky, I would imagine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. but like any, it doesn't matter about speed, it's like yeah. feel. That's something that you can practice as long as you like. You can mm. practice like twelve hours a day. You won't get feel. You won't. You won't practice feel. It's something that's uh, intuitive and innate. Mm. And some people haven't even got it. And I, you know, I don't think that I've got as much feel. I, it's hard to find in those little breaks in the pocket where you know where to play and where not to play and feel it. And I got, like I said, I look up to those musicians far more than I look up to technically adept players. Well, that's the same for you. Yeah. No, I, I totally understand what you're saying there. I think, um, I think, I think, in terms of my, my own, like uh, my own uh, relationship with practicing, I guess to kind of like uh, you know bring it back to that kind of uh, like the crux of the question. I think, uh, I think, uh, yeah, as you said, uh, first of all, yeah, time is the biggest uh, is the biggest issue, isn't it? And especially in our situation because. We're involved in in every single aspect of, mm. of running a band, you know, essentially running a business. Essentially, what we're, is what we've got here, and we're involved in every single aspect outside of music as well. And uh, and yeah, yeah, that takes up so much time. That take that takes you away from you know from from the practicing and the, and the and the instrument, you know. So I think for me, I think the, the majority of my practice is more repertoire, more than more than technical stuff, but. As we talked about with collaborations, you know, you know, the guys, are, the guys are alongside you, they say, well, you've got to look at this technique, look at this technique and so on like that. Mm -hmm. But you've also, I think uh, there's also like a, a good, um, you know, a, a good like a, a marriage to make. You've got to kind of, oh, well, kind of pick your battles, I suppose, look at your technique and kind of think, well, 
do I, you know, is it worth me really, really going to, you know, really going to town on it and trying to make sure that, I, that I, I either completely change it or improve it to make, you know, to make a significant step? Or do I just have to just tell myself, well, actually, I just need to practice this thing more, you know, do I stick with what I do and just practice it more? And, uh, and I kind of find that I, yeah, I kind of do that the most when I'm, when I'm playing our repertoire, while I'm playing our songs. And uh, and I'm playing everything, and any 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 kind of feed, bad feeling I get, and I think, oh, that that bit wasn't played quite right. That will then encourage me to look at the technical side and just kind of think, okay, well, okay, I see, I've I've played it like this actually. Maybe that was that feels a little bit uncomfortable. I'll try it like this, and hopefully, you know, hopefully that will send you down the right path. It might send you down a completely different path, but hopefully, hopefully you see you see the progress uh, that you want and. Uh, uh, well, I guess uh, yeah. Instead of just having to spend hours and hours and hours working on on technical stuff, hopefully you just kind of zero in on on what uh, on what you really do need for you know for your repertoire. Hopefully that makes sense. Well, yeah. uh, I, I would. I think I just want to interject one piece of value into this conversation, and that is, you know, I think feel can be learned, just like yeah. any other skill, and I think it's a question of how much time one puts to practicing it. Because if you if you put all day every day to playing note for note, and when I say note for note, I don't just mean matching the notes, I mean also matching the feel of a certain musician or a certain record or a certain genre, eventually you do acquire that skill and you do acquire the feeling. Now, I will say that I believe playing live with musicians who've dedicated their lives to that genre is going to be the best, most authentic way of doing that that's going to get you the, the result the fastest. But I do think feel can be learned. I see what you mean. I think that maybe I'm talking in terms of rhythmic feel um, rather than, I know what you're saying. Like you yeah. can analyze guitars and you can see like, you know, the little quarter steps and, and copy and vibrato. Yeah. That is feel. You, you, can, you, you definitely can emulate that and you can develop your own. But I think rhythmic feel is something that you have to, you can't, if you practice, for instance, playing on the beat and concentrate, playing on the beat, I need to play on the beat, you have to at some point relax enough. If you can't relax and le and sort of become, really sort of become one with music in a sense, if you don't relax and you, have, and you, you will not be able to play in time, it's impossible to play perfectly in time or with any degree of feel if you really tensed up and concentrating it is but it's really a difficult from i think for, i suppose i'm speaking from a personal point of view is if i notice that if i don't relax and if i don't try i have to stop trying if you know what i mean and just let it go and just and just try and and, and try and that's what i mean if i concentrate and practice feel no chance <laughs> I let it all go and just say, just you know, try and feel it, try and feel it. That's when you get it. It's it's a very difficult thing to attain by concentrating, I suppose. And I'm talking specifically rhythmically, mind. I I understand what you were saying perfectly. Why well, I agree with it. Well, okay. Could we take that one step further? And could we suppose that the fact that you are able to go to that beautiful rhythmic place when you're not thinking about it is a product of having previously practiced rhythm and that you got to a place of unconscious mastery you did your ten thousand hours on rhythm no no because yeah the reason i'd say no is because you can just I'll, like my wife for instance in the other room if i put on a piece of music she'll tap her foot to it or something like that and it'll be bang on because she ain't thinking about it she ain't conscious of the fact she's huh. never She'd never practiced, you know, tapping out crotchets or quavers or anything like that. And she'll tell you, by her own admission, she got no musical capabilities whatsoever. And it's not just, um, you know, she's not special <laughs> in the sense that everybody, you know. Careful now. <laughs> and, it's like, and it's the same with, like, singing, to be honest. With you. I just feel the same way about singing. Hmm. I don't think, it's like, how on earth do you, you can learn vibrato, you can learn how to breathe. But like, how do you learn how to pitch a note? In a sense, it's like it's it's weird. I can pitch to something if I play a chord. I can pitch a thing, and either you could probably do it. Yeah, yeah. It's a strange thing. You can either there's there's not many people you encounter who are not there's not many who can't pitch to something at least or at least emulate a singer. It's a strange one, uh, you know, even yeah. with the and, and the rhythm. So yeah, I do think yeah, you're right. 
Rhiannon certainly wouldn't be in that room counting in groups of five again saying, buddy, 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 buddy. <laughs> you know, that is stuff that has to be learned and things like that. So you're right. Yeah. The, 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 but like, I think the feel is generally innate. And huh. I think it's, it, that's, that's just my opinion. Is that like somebody's yeah. musical voice being able to emulate somebody's yes. musical voice? Yeah. That's yeah, different. That's a different. Yeah. Thing. That's yeah. a very different. Yeah. That's a whole other um, subject to talk about, though. Isn't it? I, yeah, but it is like sort of rhythm and melody mm. is is distinct for me. Is di- distinctly different because like I, I do listen to like guitar players, as you said, and you just listen to their like for me a guitar player is, and even a singer to be honest. So their, their um, personality is defined by their phrasing or their legato, and you can steal those things. You can steal them quite easily because you can use, but it's still unbelievable feel. They didn't, they, you know, it's still sub, that vibrato a lot of times was subconscious. And that vibrato on their voice is a lot mm. of times subconscious. It's mm. actually dictated by mm. you know, the intensity of the music, for instance. You might have a wide vibrato on at the end of one particular line, or if it's a softer song. Yeah, that's very true. It's never sequenced, the vibrato is always out of sequence really is it's a, a feel or they got alison kraus like i always oh. remember it's alison kraus she doesn't put any vibrato on any of her notes and like the, the the thought of listening to a music any musician whether it's a vocalist or a guitar player playing one note and having no vibrato you're thinking what are you doing but she her voice is that incredible it's sort of an un- undetectable lack of vibrato. It's like no vibrato at all on it. And it sounds incredible. Absolutely incredible voice. Well, fellas, do you think we could delineate between feel and artistic taste? Yeah, because one person's feel, I suppose, is that, like, for instance, I can't stand um, Kirk Amit's vibrato. I, I really... <laughs> I can't stand it. And like, there's a lot of guitarists. Well, not a lot, actually. It's, I can't handle the nervous. I really despise nervous vibrato. <laughs> um, I can't stand it. I really... Uh, that's his feel, though. He li- he obviously likes that. I, I, I think it's horrendous. I actually... It really... It just... It's painful to listen to. Like, And I've got a cheek. It's not know, soulful. <laughs> it is like soul. soulful vibrato. Yeah, it's but just, you can have like decent. wide, fast vibrato, like Malmsteen, for instance. Yeah, yeah, you yeah. can't tell me no matter what, nobody could listen to his vibrato and say there's no passion there. There's, there's tons of passion in there. Um, but yeah, what do you think? <laughs> Well, it's me just yapping. I know I'm no. like. I, just, so I have to be curbed if you know, Dan. You don't ever be on. afraid to say, oi. <laughs> yeah. you know, oh, I, I wouldn't dare. I wouldn't. I, you, you forget. I'm trying to get into the band here. There's, there's no way I'm going to tell you. <laughs> <Yeah. to play. laughs> um, I, I, I forgot what we were talking about. What we were talking about? <laughs> <See>? <laughs> I, I directed it elsewhere. Yeah. So, could you define? Well, let let's talk about this. Let's talk about significant lessons you guys have learned. You've written a lot of songs now. What are some significant lessons you've learned or like mistakes that you don't make anymore that you used to make that you could save someone a lot of hours if you if they heard this now around creating songs, writing songs, recording, that whole process? Um, hmm. um, I think uh, I think uh, from my point of view, I would maybe say that uh, yeah, everything doesn't. Uh, even though I definitely felt that felt that comp- uh, compulsion when I was first like, kind of like writing drum parts with you and writing drum parts of the band. I I think at first I wanted everything to be you know everything to be composed really precisely and be and you know, you know oh yeah almost have that little bit of perfection uh, perfectionism in me and thinking I need to think of the perfect thing to go in this bit and the perfect fill to go here and the perfect groove to go in there. And uh, and quite often when we go go into the studio, uh, lots of the times things yeah things won't be won't be set in stone like uh, like between us and then there'll be a moment where we improvise and play and play something you know from the control room out here and say oh play something like this try doing it with that thing like that and straight away something magical happens because you realise oh yeah that bit actually sounds perfect and and yeah I think that's one of the one of the biggest things uh, uh, that I've learned in terms of like in terms of recording. Is to try yeah, to try not to be too much of a perfectionist and try not to worry about having the perfect composition, but let yourself try to you know try to improvise and and experiment and yeah, just see 
see in the moment when you know when you're you're well in my case when you're sitting at the kit and you're in and you're in the control room and they're pressing record you just gotta see what comes out in that moment and yeah hopefully something magical will happen and you think well there we are that's it that's what that's where it's meant to be you know and uh, mm-hmm. and yeah it didn't meant it wasn't meant to be this particular way that you that you were stressing and worrying about all this way it was meant to be this way because it gives you that great feel yeah don't be too hung up on ideas when you're songwriting that's one thing i learned actually if you if you have an idea to offer the guys for a particular song uh, if it's not working don't be afraid to say to yourself oh it's not working we'll come up with a new idea where you can spend hours and hours trying to make something work and it just doesn't so just move on to the new idea that's why my, answer, my answers are a lot shorter than <laughs> <laughs> I don't think they're I still don't. very good they're still very good <laughs> yeah <laughs> I don't think I I have any advice to pass on. If I'm honest, I, I I I can't think of anything I've done wrong in the last. <laughs> <laughs> anything I haven't I haven't I can't think of anything that I would rectify because I enjoy the process. It's like it's important to make all the mistakes mm-hmm. and do okay. things or you consider wrong. Because sure. Yeah. So h- how about we frame it this way? Do you still write and create songs today the same way you did ten years ago? No. Ah, so could you tell us how you how you created ten years ago and how you create now, and what what's changed? What, one thing is actually you've actually now you've now you've prodded. There is one thing: is uh, don't be don't be lazy, and learn to use the technology that's in front of it. Don't pretend you know we all got digital audio workstations, and I was guilty for many many years of just using it. Press record, record some audio. And the way that I used to compose music is insane anyway. So I would, like, I would go, so I'd get an idea. There'd be no drums to my idea. I'd go, I'd take the idea down to Tom in the, uh, into a rehearsal room. He would do some, I'd say, oh, play some beats over this, you know, and he'd play some beats over it. Then I'd come back with those beats on audio, put them into the DAW. I'd use some bits, splice everything up, then take snares, hi hats, they can create my own beats. It's insane. Uh, they do uh, just like when there was a sequencer package, they could just use like like Superior Drummer. Like, and someone even mentioned to me, "Well, why didn't you use Superior?" It's just because I couldn't be bothered to learn anything. So, like in the last five years, uh, no, three years, I, I've been uh, consciously learning how to use because I'm really lazy when it comes to technology. I can't be bothered. I just wanted to get on with stuff. Um, but I've just started to learn production techniques and realizing just how important like compression is. I know it's obvious to people compression um, and just, you know, even putting things on your master bus to create, to, you know, to create good demos that inspire other, uh, you know, other bandmates to come. And, mm-hmm. and like uh, Gavin's taught me a lot, loads of stuff about it. His synth work is, is incredible. Uh, he, he comes up with loads of different ideas because he takes the time. He's like, Usually, I'll defer to uh, I'll get Gavin to learn something and then show me how to learn it. <laughs> how to use it, basically, because he's so much. I really because I can't look at a screen for long before I start like wanting to sleep because it just hurts my eyes for some reason. I can read stuff, you know, I like reading, but like looking at screens, it's just I, if I look at it too long, I won't sleep at night either. It's just so just how bizarre it is. So, but I think is. Listen, we've got, we've got incredible technology at our fingertips. This cheap and accessible. Um, learn how to use it properly, and you'll be shocked at just how many potential ideas. If you've you still got to study and you've still got to practice and you've, uh, music, but if you do that in conjunction with learning how to use a technology, that technology, mm-hmm. uh, whether it's synths or drums, that'll inspire new material and also make the songwriting process a damn sight easier because like i'll write entire songs now doing my own drums and then i'll get tom bring him over and say i'll listen to this tom he'll pick out say yeah we'll keep that we'll keep that that's okay and then he'll put together on he'll set up his midi drums plug them into superior drummer so we've got and then he'll play over it and it's just this is this is amazing you know something that would take would have taken me weeks just in, just to my own ignorance, just no more than my own ignorance and laziness. Now it takes me 
you know, hours rather than than weeks. So I'd say, yeah, just make just learn to use. I don't think young people, younger people, have this issue anyway. I think they they just they seem to embrace technology until they get to a certain age, and then they Perhaps, stop. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, I think yeah, the music industry is constantly evolving. You as a musician, you just got to want to evolve with it. Yeah, and if you get like um, DAWs, and you'd be surprised how much you learn, as you said. Uh, about music theory, I thought that's where I learned more about time signatures by like playing to a click. And if you come up with a riff idea or something, and you think, oh, what time signature is in that? If you played it to a click, you can just count it. And that's how I learned more about time signatures that way. So. And also, don't be a snob. Yeah. Don't be a musical snob either. Yeah. Because, like, I grew up like in lots of different types of music. But, like, even me, with listening to that type of music, like, say, hip hop and things like that, I used to grow up listening to that. I used to think that. You know, it's just someone putting a drum beat down and just rapping over it. And no, not no. at all. These no. people are geniuses. Yes. These people are musical geniuses as well. Oh. What? Because they got their sounds from a computer doesn't make them a musician. It's Shut up. It, yeah. You know, this everybody, and this is me talking to myself now, mate. Right? <laughs> because, like, they can, you know, it, these people, the more you look at it, the more you see what they do. And even pop, pop music is full of incredible production, incredible musicians. Don't turn your nose up at anything at all, because musicians, and especially musicians of our genre, um, like in not metal, but you know, just of our age, I suppose, <laughs> perhaps, just look down upon certain form of music. No, 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 no. It's just different types. They're no less talented, um, and it's and like I said, that some of the stuff. Um, that, it, that people have looked down upon the past, like pop music and things like that. You've got to be joking. There's some incredible things going on in all genres. Well, I have one more question for you, fellas. And uh, before I head into that question, I would like to provide uh, just a little, a little, a little thought experiment here. So, a lot of times we'll hear people say, "Oh, well, you know, uh, back in my day, we had to get out the Tascam four track, and you'd have to, <laughs> yeah, you know, you'd have to bounce the tracks over to make room for more tracks." I'm sure you guys remember those days. Mm -hmm. And then some people say, "And now the kids are cheating." Well, here's here's my question: Did the first guy? who figured out how to put a bridge on a guitar that was going to keep his guitar in tune. Did all the other guitarists come around in the town square that I go, oh, Jim, he's got a bridge on his guitar. It stays in tune all the time. What is he even doing? Yeah. So it's like embrace the technology. It's there to make your life easier. Absolutely. Man. Yeah, absolutely. All right. My, my last question for you guys is if you could all go back to the – first day you picked up your instruments and you could only tell yourself one thing about music and about playing music what would that one thing be this is going to be hard <laughs> <laughs> no, is that hard oh, yeah this mm. is tricky because um, instinctively i just want to say put it down <laughs> <laughs> I suppose um, I'd tell myself to have a bit more of a broader taste in music mm. at that age, because I was, I was probably a bit more narrow-minded musically, uh, typical teenager into metal music at the time. It's like, oh, metal music, metal music, but um, didn't realise, oh, there's all this great music out there that needs to be explored. But then I suppose I found it at the right time. You find it when you find it. But, yeah. That's a really good answer. That's, no, it is because that's exactly. I, I didn't think that. I couldn't think of anything, and that's exactly yeah. how I felt. Because like we grew up in a same yeah. similar yeah. era, where like, it was just shred. You learn to play fast. That's what play. That's what being. Uh, a, I, again, just looked down on so many different types of music at that yeah, time. Yeah, so, yeah. Well, that's not a solo. <laughs> you know what I mean? What are you doing? That's not a solo. What are you doing? With You're strumming. Yeah. Strumming a guitar. And just thinking of like these, like these great, these rhythm players, like, and with the solo, do you with know what solo, I mean? Yeah. And I used to like, I'd fast forward songs to listen to the solo. Mm. That's what I would do. I would yeah. fast forward, uh, no interest in that. Sorry, what's the solo? Solo, please. Yeah. And just, whereas I would say, hey, solos last for about 30 seconds in a song, you idiot. <laughs> and most people, 90% 90, 90 of people don't want to listen to it anyway. So why are you spending 90% of your time 
learning something that 90% of people don't even want to listen to. But not only that, I think I have far, 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 far more admiration, as we talked earlier on, for rhythm players. I think from like what changed my attitude was when I was, I think, when I was about 25, um, I went down to the Guitar Institute in London to study part-time. I think we did it for about two years, like two, three days a week. And I went down there to learn how to play even faster, basically. <laughs> That's all I was there for. And uh, like I realised, all these other, like I was being put into blues classes and uh, jazz things, just mm. jazz classes. And, what's this? And then, by the end of it, I think, these players are unbelievable. These, these, this, I can't, I, hold on, I can't do any of this. Mm. I've looked down upon it, I'm not even physically capable of doing any of this. What, but, uh, uh, and like, I realised that playing with great rhythm guitar is f infinitely more difficult than playing technical lead guitar. And I'm not talking about today's standards because a lot of technical guitar to these days is actually phenomenal. You know, there's, these are not just people playing fast, for instance. There's a lot of melodic content mm. in what they're playing, and it's extremely interesting. And harmonic. Yeah. Is Harmonically, it? when you delve more into harmony, that's more of a challenge than learning any guitar solo. So I think I'm just, I'm not mm. talking about today's lead players. I'm talking about, you know, I'd say probably from five years, you know, mm. back in the, in, the, in the 90s, 2000, 2010s. Mm. Um, you know, I don't, I, I don't look up to fast technical players i look at great rhythm because i think that's this much harder and of more value in to be honest because that provides the basis of a song you know there's more value there's, there's a lot of value in bass guitar and, and drummers and they're often are derided and mocked uh, <laughs> yeah. i enjoy it as well to be honest that's the yeah, he and does. Mocking he does. constantly. <laughs> he does. but they, these things are just so vital like the solo aspect of stuff um, I end up, um, and after that, I ended up spending you know ninety percent of my time on rhythm stuff. Mm -hmm. Then just learning to be a better rhythm player because that provides um, a better foundation for actually writing music, which ultimately should be the goal of anybody who picks up an instrument to a large degree. Not everybody, because like without great session players or great. Uh, like great session players and, mm. and like hired guns and whatnot, they 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 equally is required. But most people pick up an instrument to want to create something, and there's no much joy in creating a thirty second solo. Really, mm. you need to provide the context for that solo as well. Yeah, okay. you it's, it's my turn now. <laughs> <laughs> okay, yeah, all right. So, yeah, so if I'm yeah, if I'm go going back to myself uh, day one and kind of uh, trying to give them some advice. Yeah, if uh, if uh, well, I think I think at that time for for me, I think I did really think that this is something that I wanted wanted to try to pursue and to try to make make my make my job, make my career. So I think if I was going back to to somebody, not just me, and saying, yeah, does, is is this something that you want to pursue and you want to do this properly? And if they say yes, and I say okay, the first thing that you should probably probably realize and remember is that whatever your favorite kind of genre of music is, whatever your favorite band is. Uh, wherever your favorite drummer is that you want to play exactly like you can do all that but that's not how you make your career mm. because, because yeah i was very very guilty of that when i first started playing drums and i did a similar thing to darren i went off and studied studied music as well and straight away as i was trying to kind of like position myself into bands and things like that i would straight away be trying to play the kind of drums for songs that i wanted to play but it was nowhere near what you know what was needed and you know desired by the people I, that I was working with. You know, if I was playing in like a in a softer, uh, uh, like a like a almost like a pop rock kind of band, I remember one example. I was playing parts and parts to the songs where I was like I was channeling Keith Moon and I was going <laughs> like that, and I was doing all of that. And and of course, yeah, guess what happened? You know, when you get when it time until time to, uh, came to get uh, get ready for one particular gig. Guess who wasn't on drums? This guy, you know. So, so it's just yeah. It's uh, you straight away or straight away. Uh, you know, learn. You know, you can learn it the hard way straight away. But I think maybe from day one, I would say if you want to if you want to take this very seriously and you want to make this a career, don't just be playing metal all the time. Don't just play, be playing prog rock all the time. 
play a bit of everything. Try you know whatever kind of uh, whatever kind of uh, genres that you that you like and you take your take your fancy to or. Yeah, wherever wherever there might be an opportunity to really invest your time into whatever that particular genre will be, because that will help you. That will help you get work. That will help you become a, become a musician and not have to to work in an office all the time, kind of thing. You know, just do something that you love. You know, and uh, and yeah, pursue that to, to the best of your ability. And on that note, haha. From right to left on your screen, ladies and gentlemen, we have Gavin. Darren and Tom from the band God Sticks, their sixth studio album, This Is What A Winner Looks Like, is out now. Check out links in the video description if you're on video and in the show notes if you're on audio. Thank you, fellas, so much for coming to hang out with me. Thank you very Cheers. much. Cheers.